Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you um, to our um, last talk of the autumn quarter on the COVID-19 uh, issue. Um, we'll, we'll resume on January 6 with, the, um, with 11 talks during the winter quarter and an additional seven talks during the spring quarter. Um, it's an honor for me to introduce you to Dr. Peter Singer. Uh, Dr. Singer is special advisor to the Director General, Dr. Tedros uh, Adenom uh, Gibriasis, Gibriasis um, uh, at the World Health Organization, and where, where Peter serves as the Assistant Director General of the WHO. In this role, uh, Dr. Singer uh, supports the Director General to transform the WHO into an organization sharply focused on impact at the individual country level. Dr. Singer co-chaired the transition team, was the architect of WHO's strategy and its triple billion target, and works with colleagues to guide consistent strategy implementation of WHO's program budget. Before joining WHO, Peter Singer co-founded two innovative social impact organizations in Canada. Um, from 1996 to 2006, Peter was the Sun Life Financial Chair and Director of the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics, which some believe is the largest centre for bioethics uh, in North America. He also was Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and a senior scientist at the University Health Network. From 20, 2008 to 2018, uh, Peter was Chief Executive Officer of a program called Grand Challenges Canada. During this period, Grand Challenges Canada raised $450 million to support a thousand innovations in more than 90 countries, which had the potential to save one and a half million lives and to improve the lives of 35 million people. In 2007, Dr. Singer received the Michael Smith Prize as Canada's Health Researcher of the Year. Uh, in 2011, uh, Peter Singer was given the highest honor in Canada when he was appointed Officer of the Order of Canada for his contributions to health research and bioethics and for his dedication to improving the health of people in developing countries. Peter is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, of the Canadian Ac Academy of Health Sciences, where he's foreign secretary, and of the US National Academy of Medicine. As a researcher, Peter has published over 300 articles, has received over $50 million in research grants, and mentored hundreds of students. He studied internal medicine at the University of Toronto. He trained as an ethics fellow here at the University of Chicago at the McLean Center, and then studied for three years with Al Feinstein as a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar at Yale University. And then he returned to Toronto uh, in, in 2006, in, in, I'm sorry, in 1996. Um, it's a huge pleasure to introduce my dear friend and long-term colleague, Peter Singer. His talk today is entitled COVID-19, the World Health Organization and the Value of Multilateralism. Peter is going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll be open um, to widespread questioning um, from the audience um, uh, who are with us. Um, and uh, we will go on uh, at least until one o'clock uh, with that. Um, so with, with that background, uh, let, let me introduce you to Dr. Peter Singer. Peter. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It's really so wonderful to be with you, my old friend, 
uh, of long, of long, long duration. I was just calculating. It's uh, 33 years ago that we were together in uh, in Chicago. But in a sense, you're, you you and and the McLean Center program are with me uh, every day. It's a very special year for you, I know. And let me just start by thanking you and your uh, whole family who've supported you and all your colleagues at the at the McLean Center. It's such a special place. And in particular, I think there's very few people who can say, A, they created a field, in your case, clinical ethics, and B, they populated it. And in your case, with 500 fellows. And it really is a remarkable achievement. And your warmth and your uh, support um, for uh, everyone you come in contact with and your excellence in medicine is, is, I think, just very much appreciated by everybody. So let me just start with that very, very special tribute to you, my friend, and, and my respect and <clears throat> appreciation. So thank you for everything that you do, that you've done, that you'll continue to do. And thank you to Anna and the kids and everyone that supported you at the center. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, I want to focus in on uh, uh, what really has been a terrible year, 2020, um, because of COVID-19. But actually, my message is one of hope. Uh, as we end this annus horribilis, uh, there really is uh, a very, very strong signal of better days to come. But there's uh, unfortunately going to be a harsh COVID winter before there's a warm COVID spring. Uh, as of today, uh, WHO's had 67 million cases of COVID-19 reported to it. Uh, 1.5 million people have died worldwide. And I just wanna start this um, uh, seminar by expressing on behalf of the World Health Organization, my condolences to the families of those who've died in, in Chicago, in the United States and around the world. Um, and, uh, also my respect and appreciation and the respect and appreciation of the World Health Organization of its Director General, Dr. Tedros, for health workers and indeed all essential workers who put themselves in harm's way to benefit their communities. Health workers uh, constitute about 3% of the global population and about 14% of cases of COVID. So obviously they're bearing a disproportionate uh, burden and health workers and, and all essential workers, the grocery clerk, the gas station attendant, um, the, all the folks that work in health facilities really deserve all our respect and appreciation and, and beyond respect and appreciation, whatever tangible support we can provide. I think most people realize this is the worst, certainly the worst global public health crisis or acute global public health crisis in a century since the 1918 influenza pandemic and probably the worst global crisis since the, uh, since the Second World War. Um, there are better days to come. And I just wanna uh, kind of uh, emphasize something that's very important and particularly as we're talking in a setting of a university, a great university, the University of Chicago. Um, I wanna emphasize the importance uh, over the past year and also over the coming year. And I'll come back to this point of young people of students, of young people, of the importance of what you can do, what you do, uh, and your voice is extremely important. And it would be a real privilege for me to stay in touch with you beyond this seminar. On Twitter, I'm at Peter A. Singer, at Peter A. Singer, and it would be terrific um, to, uh, to stay in touch with you. And obviously feel free to tweet anything I say in this open forum, at Peter A. Singer. So with that introduction, what I'd like to do is just very briefly sketch, sketch uh, one way of thinking about the COVID response and recovery. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about WHO's role in the context of this uh, sketch. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned uh, at WHO this year, and I, I came in 2017 with, uh, with, with Dr. Tedros, as, as Mark mentioned, um, if there's one thing I learned, it's the uh, vital, vital role of the World Health Organization and indeed of the multilateral system in terms of protecting the world and protecting the most vulnerable people in the world. You know, one way to think about the COVID uh, response and recovery is almost like a house. And uh, the foundations of the house, and I think this is very relevant for um, an ethics center, a talk in an ethics center and in a university actually are some fundamental values. They are the value of trust, 
in fact, trust in government is the thing that seems to be very, very strongly associated with successful responses in terms of mortality rates. Uh, leadership, which can strengthen or erode that trust. Uh, solidarity, which is so important uh, in terms of um, people caring for the, their neighbors, caring for uh, people in other countries. And I'll come back to uh, this point in relationship to vaccines. And uh, probably most of all, equity. You know, in the Sustainable Development Goals, we talk about leaving no one behind. Uh, but the way that COVID has unveiled and revealed and shone a bright light, and often very harshly so, on the pre-existing social inequities and inequalities in, in society um, has, I think, been uh, unparalleled and um, I think even unexpected the degree to which that has occurred. So uh, trust, leadership, solidarity, equity, those are the foundations of the response and recovery. And I think it's very telling that these are, if you will, the soft infrastructure, the the, the many of those being ethical values, that is really the most important foundation of the response. And it's also something Dr. Tedros has emphasized in more than 120 uh, news conferences when he's come to meet the global media during 2020 to discuss COVID. Uh, it, it's uh, especially the idea of solidarity and the concept of solidarity and the value of solidarity is something that he's uh, emphasized. Um, so that, if you will, is the, is the values foundation of the house that is the COVID response and recovery. The, the first floor is the uh, essential public health measures. And from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, WHO has emphasized the essential public health measures with testing at the heart, uh, isolating and supporting cases, tracing and quarantining contacts. Any country that has really been effective at suppressing COVID and, and several have. Um, there's a hundred fold variation, for example, more than a hundred fold variation in mortality rate uh, across countries, which is really stark. Um, in any event, uh, any country that's been effective suppressing COVID uh, has, uh, has really put those public health measures at its heart of testing, isolating and caring for cases, tracing and quarantining contacts. And of course, around that, you have the, the importance of masking and uh, the IHME estimates of life-saving aspects of masking. Uh, you have uh, physical distance. You have um, avoiding poorly ventilated indoor spaces and of course, staying at home when you're sick and, and, uh, and so on. So those uh, public health measures and as a last resort, the more um, restrictive measures, the so-called lockdowns, which sometimes unfortunately are necessary, including now when we have rising cases in many parts of the, the world, um, uh, those public health measures are absolutely essential. They were essential uh, all through last year. They'll be essential through the rollout of the vaccine and they'll be essential after the vaccine is rolled out. So the foundation of the house is these values of trust, leadership, equity, solidarity. The first floor is these uh, public health measures, the tried and true public health measures, including the shoe leather epidemiology. Um, the second floor is the new scientific tools. And here, of course, we're talking about uh, diagnostics, which have a very, very important role, uh, drugs and vaccines. Uh, and I'm gonna spend a lot of these opening remarks on vaccines because that's really an area that gives us a lot of hope. Um, but uh, don't forget diagnostics and drugs. And in fact, what you see in COVID is a remarkable and unprecedented scientific effort across the board there. If you look at January, uh, you know, in the <clears throat> WHO first uh, was notified on December 31st of 2019 of uh, what was ultimately called COVID. Uh, and by the uh, second week, by the first week, WHO was notifying countries and the public, et cetera, ringing the alarm bell. By the second week, uh, it was supporting uh, the release of the genome. Uh, uh, and uh, by the third week, that genomic information had been turned into uh, molecular diagnostics that WHO then started to ship around the world uh, and also um, 
uh, the uh, design of the mRNA vaccine. And I'll come back to that story. But that rapid cycle from genomic information to diagnostic and vaccine, mRNA vaccine, messenger RNA vaccine, is, is unprecedented and one that will serve as a platform for as countermeasures for future uh, pandemic preparedness as well. So I'll come back to the vaccine in a moment, but I wanna complete the picture of the house, uh, the attic. The attic is the recovery. And um, I don't wanna talk much about the recovery because we're in the midst of the rollout effort for the vaccine, but I do wanna um, uh, put it there, a so-called building back better, which unless we're specific about it can become a mere slogan. On the other hand, there's great opportunities to make meaningful change in building back better. For example, through the availability of oxygen by face mask. Um, you know, pneumonia is one of the leading causes of death of children under the age of five. It's estimated that uh, 800,000 children out of the 5 million who die um, uh, every year, uh, 800,000 die of pneumonia. It's the largest cause of death after the newborn period. And uh, it's estimated that maybe 20 to 40% uh, of those uh, children could be saved with a uh, simple measure like oxygen. So that's being promoted for uh, COVID. So it's come for the COVID, stay for the pneumonia and the safe surgery. And that's a good example of building back better in the recovery. The other thing I wanna emphasize in the recovery is um, the importance of primary health care and resilient health systems. The important for not only essential services, but also multi-sectoral whole government approaches and um, community empowerment. Communities have played a central role in um, addressing the pandemic. So I wanted to sketch a quick model, if you will, or a picture <clears throat> of pandemic response and recovery of a house. The foundation being the values, trust, solidarity, the uh, overriding importance of equity. The first floor being the tried and true public health measures with the testing at its heart and isolating cases, quarantine and contacts. The first floor being the new scientific tools and the attic, or maybe I should say the, the, the second floor uh, being, um, being the recovery with primary health care at its center. And primary health care, of course, is very, very dedicated to equity as well, um, which is so important in the, uh, in the recovery period. Now where I'd like to focus is that second floor of the house. Um, and in particular, I'd like to zero down on vaccines because that's what's giving us uh, the signal that there truly are better days ahead. Uh, I wanna start by saying that what we've seen is an unprecedented scientific effort in vaccine development and shortly deployment. More than 210 vaccines in the pipeline, uh, more than 50 in human trials, 12 or 13 in late stage phase three human trials, um, three or four or five of which now have, uh, have reported uh, results in one way or the, uh, or, or the other, let's say four have. Um, the, uh, obviously the, the, the big news came with uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, and the Moderna vaccines, but AstraZeneca Oxford has recently reported. And uh, it's important also to realize that the um, uh, Russian vaccine has reported as, and the Chinese is in the process of being deployed, the Chinese vaccine. So uh, really vaccines spreading around the world. And what's remarkable is the different platforms these are on. Uh, you know, the very, very strong efficacy of the messenger RNA vaccines and, uh, and, um, and uh, the idea that that's a novel platform and uh, the Pfizer BioNTech, for example, and the Moderna, these would be the first time that uh, such vaccines are uh, licensed, messenger RNA vaccines um, ever. Uh, and we can go through the different types of vaccines, lots of good news in the last two or three weeks, more to come some uh, registrations with regulators, more to come. And even the start of a rollout in the UK yesterday with William Shakespeare of all people being one of the first people who was uh, vaccinated. Uh, back in May, uh, the World Health Assembly, which is all the governments in the world, their health ministers uh, declared, passed a resolution that said that immunization is a global public good. Um, WHO then developed an allocation framework which uh, offered uh, prioritization to health workers, to vulnerable people, including the elderly and those with comorbidities. Um, some modeling studies that show it's better to uh, vaccinate some people in all countries rather than all people in some countries. Remarkably, that cuts the death rate. So simply 
the way you distribute the vaccine around the world has a significant effect on mortality. And then of course, the access to COVID tools accelerator led by WHO, but in partnership with uh, other groups whose goal is to, um, as it name implies, accelerate the development of, but also facilitate the deployment of uh, diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, and uh, in its health system connector, ensure that health systems around the world are prepared to deploy those new scientific tools and technologies. Um, the goal in vaccines is 2 billion doses by the end of 2021 through the ACT Accelerator. And you can think about the ACT Accelerator both as a lifeline and an insurance policy. It's a lifeline for the 92 Gavi eligible countries um, who otherwise may not be able to afford uh, these vaccines. And it's an insurance policy for all countries because it invests in a wide portfolio of vaccines and so offers real vaccine choice for, uh, for, for every country. Um, 189 um, economies have joined the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator and it's up and running, ready to go, uh, has had some funding already, um, but at this point, uh, the main uh, limitation on the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator known as COVAX um, and partnered with uh, Gavi and with CEPI you know, alongside WHO is actually funding. Uh, the immediate funding shortfall is 4.3 billion US dollars um, and through 2021, an additional 23.9 billion US dollars is needed. And that might sound like a lot of money, but compared to the costs of the pandemic, it's actually not a lot of money. There was a recent paper published by Larry Summers that um, estimated the cost of this pandemic to the United States alone at $16 trillion. When you think about the more than $10 trillion in stimulus to date from OECD countries, it really puts that into uh, perspective. It's actually a very, very high return on investment and it, the vaccine needs to be allocated around the world. Moving from vaccine development, the next uh, uh, issue to talk about and uh, uh, let's say the next uh, barrier to focus on is vaccine delivery. We're about to embark, we already have embarked on the most significant and daunting logistical challenge in countries and around the world, probably since the Marshall Plan. Um, this is a major, major logistical effort. There are um, many elements to this, but just to name a few, uh, the Pfizer vaccine requires an ultra cold chain at minus 70, minus 80 degrees. Um, the others don't necessarily, but that makes it a little bit more difficult, obviously, to distribute. We have issues of vaccine confidence, which is much more than just information. It also has to do with, um, it also has to do with very much with trust and with the context and the historical injustices to which um, some marginalized communities have been subject. Uh, vaccine confidence. And then we have a number of necessary digital innovations, whether that be um, the ability to track and trace as uh, either vaccine lots, protect the supply chains and their integrity, um, and ensure that uh, uh, we can get people back for their second dose uh, three weeks later, in many cases. Um, and uh, then, of course, the return to work, return to play, return to um, travel aspects uh, of, of uh, knowing who has been uh, immunized, something with which WHO is in the process of grappling. If you think about those paper yellow cards for immunization and for yellow fever in particular, then you get a, start to get a sense of what that electronic task is uh, like. I was just going through my mom's stuff and, and cleaning it out. Sadly, she died um, more than 10 years ago. I was cleaning out her stuff and came across uh, her WHO immunization certificate from 1957 when she was a refugee from Hungary, which really shows you the historical significance of that international standard um, that's being worked on for COVID. So that's what I wanted to say about vaccines, but this is what is giving us much hope that there are better days to come. And in conclusion, I do wanna conclude with that sense of hope and that sense of optimism. There really are better days to come. There's a warm spring and summer coming, but a very cold and harsh winter between now and then. And please, 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 if there's one practical message I can leave you with, don't let up your guard. You don't wanna be the last person to die of COVID-19 as, as uh, vaccines are being rolled out. 
and you don't want your grandmother to be the last person to die because you gave her COVID. So please keep up the public health measures that I was uh, uh, talking about. Now is actually the time to redouble your efforts because spring is around the corner. Just hunker down. And this is obviously related to your local conditions, but uh, if there's one thing I'd love to emphasize. And then in closing, what I'd like to say is reach out again to, um, to the young people listening. I wanna say that your voice really matters. You know, the biggest challenge that the world is going to face over the next six months, arguably, is the uptake of the vaccine, the rollout of the vaccine, and issues in equity in relationship to the rollout of the vaccine. We may well see inequities developing in that rollout between countries, within countries, and it's so important for everyone, um, and, uh, including and especially young people, to raise your voice against those inequities for reasons of charity, but also for reasons of self-interest. Because until your neighbors are safe, until every country is safe, none of us are safe. And it would be great to stay in touch with you. Um, I'm Matt Peter A. Singer. And as Mark said at the outset, I really only wanted to um, talk for 20 minutes or so, which is what I've done, and leave uh, lots of time. I think we now have about half an hour for Q&A because I'm mostly interested in, in responding to your questions. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank Mark for everything that he's done. And um, obviously it shouldn't escape your notice that some of the most fundamental issues in the COVID-19 response and recovery are actually ethical values, which shows you again to come back to the importance of, of the work that Mark has done, that you all, that many of you have done with him um, and that uh, he's pioneered absolutely at the foundation, as I say, of, uh, of COVID response and uh, uh, response and recovery. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention. I really look forward to your comments and questions and really appreciate this, uh, this opportunity to be with you. It's always great to be home at the University of Chicago and the McLean Center and appreciate, Mark, the opportunity that uh, you've provided to, uh, to be with you and our colleagues online and look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Well, great, thank you so much, Dr. Singer, for, for, for those opening remarks. Um, yes, uh, I just wanna remind everybody to put your questions in the Q&A function of, of Zoom and we'll try to get to as many of them as, as we can for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, I wanna open up by, by asking a question to provide a little more background about what the WHO is and does um, for those who might not fully understand. I think we all know that it exists, but can you provide a little bit of background on sort of the purpose and mandate of the WHO and how it goes about doing what it does, um, particularly in the context now of, of the pandemic? Sure. So WHO is 73 years old. Its vision is the highest attainable standard of health for all peoples. Its mission, which we actually said in the strategy um, that uh, was developed when Dr. Tedros came uh, and was approved by all governments of the world health ministers in 2018, less than a year after he started uh, this strategic plan, so-called general program of work 13, is um, to promote health, keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. In that strategic plan, we set a uh, so-called triple billion target. And it's an, it's a, it's an SDG based target. So we basically took the 50 health related sustainable development goals, turned them into three targets, triple billion, and, uh, and increased actually before COVID the importance of health emergencies protection, one of the three billion. And the triple billion target is um, to uh, a billion more people better protected with universal health coverage, which is not only access and service delivery, but also financial protection. A billion people living healthier lives with better well being, which is all the multi sectoral things, road traffic accidents, uh, cigarette smoking, et cetera clean water, uh, sanitation, um, uh, and a billion people better protected from health emergencies. So triple billion target. And then in terms of WHO's functions, um, it uh, really has three functions. One is its leadership function. And I think you've seen that during uh, uh, COVID. Um, its second function is uh, so-called global goods. 
which is its guidance, the highest level of which is the international law, for example, a convention, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the international health regulations, but also the uh, few hundred or so guidelines, uh, clinical guidelines, guidelines, public health guidelines that WHO puts out every year. And then its function in research, I mentioned the ACT Accelerator and in data. And then finally, support to countries. WHO has a footprint of 150 country offices in six regions, about 8,000 people. Its budget, um, depending on how you uh, uh, depending on how you count it, is actually um, about the size of a large uh, teaching hospital. Let's say it's three billion a year. That's a little bit bigger than its its, its budget, but is a, um, so it's about three billion a year. And uh, so that's what WHO does. And as I said at the outset. Uh, Brian, it's uh, what I've learned at WHO is how essential it is to the most vulnerable people in the world. And I mentioned some of the things it does and did in COVID as we went along. It's leadership in meeting the media and uh, really emphasizing the public health functions, uh, shipping the diagnostics, training millions of health workers online for things like donning and doffing personal protective equipment, um, uh, the normative guidance, the, the advice it's going to be giving that it is giving on vaccines for which vaccines, which populations, et cetera, the pre-qualification of vaccines, uh, almost the type of quasi-regulatory function in the normative sense. I'm just listing some, some uh, COVID related things and um, you know, more than a hundred surge missions to hotspots, whether or not there are country offices there to assist governments and support governments in responding to the pandemic. So that's a little bit about WHO and how I think it's been quite essential in the pandemic and, um, and uh, very essential uh, in all kinds of other ways. There's very little that you do in health that isn't touched by the World Health Organization. So when you go out for a beer at your local bar and there's no uh, smoking, when there are bars, when there were bars, when there will be bars, uh, and there's no smoking, that is because of the local governments, obviously, and the national governments, but um, ultimately the international treaty behind that is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Great. Just as an example. Great. Um, just to sort of get the political question out of the way, uh, you know, as a large multinational organization in the sort of current geopolitical context where there are sort of large dominant nations or that have may have conflicting views, um, how does the WHO navigate that and gain trust of the international community? So um, WHO has uh, 194 member states. And it is so vital to have a, a place, and this is part of its leadership function, where every country in the world can come together. And one thing you'll see um, in the interactions with member states is it's health ministers, but it's also foreign ministers, finance ministers, heads of government quite frequently interacting with Dr. Tedros and, and, and our team. Um, <coughs> the idea that every country in the world can come together and say immunization is a global public good is it extremely, extremely important. WHO treats its member states uh, equally. Um, every member state is important. It supports every member state. And like the Sustainable Development Goals, WHO is relevant to every country in the, in the world. Um, in terms of trust, which was the thrust of your question, I think trust is built over time. And you see a lot of trust in WHO by many, many of those uh, countries. Uh, 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 and uh, that trust is built actually, I think, and this gets to the theme of this talk, through um, the importance of the multilateral system and also re a results-based multilateralism. That focus on that triple billion target. And it's not only a focus on the target, we didn't just put the target in the strategy. We developed a measurement system to measure that target, uh, those targets. Uh, we then um, are now regularly doing stock takes. We did one today that looks at progress against those targets and uh, then identifies pro thematically, geographically, what are the bottlenecks to progress, identifies ways to overcome them. You know, to take a concrete example, malaria in certain geographical jurisdictions with the tool to overcome it being um, targeting therapies, uh, interventions using data and locating malaria hotspots targeting that's a way to identify and overcome bottlenecks to malaria and a way to reduce numbers of children with malaria. Think about that across, and malaria is part of 
the service delivery related to universal health coverage and that billion. So think about it in that holistic uh, way. So that's a little bit about what uh, WHO does, a little bit about how it relates to every country in the world, a little bit about your point, why trust is important. Ultimately, trust is earned through the value of what you do. And I think that WHO has proven essential in this pandemic and it's proven essential in the 73 years of its existence. Maybe Brian, just in closing, probably its biggest accomplishment has been its role in the eradication of smallpox. Um, you know, I was floored when I learned that smallpox in the last century killed more people than all the wars combined, 300 million people. You know how many people smallpox has killed in this century? Zero. You know why? Because it's been eradicated through the efforts of WHO supporting just one example. Maybe it's a really good example, but one example. And that, that, that single act, the eradication of smallpox, I think justifies every penny that's ever gone into WHO and every word that anybody's ever expended on it. And that really is just the beginning of the effect that WHO has. So that I think is how to build trust. Great. And, and since you brought up some of the sort of programs and initiatives that the WHO was working on prior to the pandemic, just as we have concerns at the community level about this sort of massive shift in resources, time, effort towards the pandemic, what ends up getting sac sacrificed? And so as, as all of this effort got shifted to the pandemic, what concerns do you have and what sort of areas are you most worried about are going to suffer the most? Thank you. So there was no question that we were behind on those sustainable development goals the world was, because remember it's countries that committed to them. WHO supports countries to achieve these things to which they committed, every country in the world. Um, uh, so we were behind on <clears throat> the triple billion target on the sustainable development goals before COVID. We're much further behind now. So the regular rate of speed in the recovery is not gonna be enough. We're gonna to have to accelerate. I'll talk in a moment about how we accelerate. But I think one of the important things is um, under Dr. Tedros' leadership and under the stewardship of our Deputy Director General, Dr. Jujana Yakub, WHO has actually kept a focus on all three billions. Uh, and it's uh, made sure that we're tracking the disruptions, that we're responding to the supporting countries on the disruptions on universal health coverage, on healthier populations, which is the multi-sectoral work, and integrating that with the uh, health emergencies protection. Remember, in addition to COVID, WHO is responding to many, many other emergencies at the same time. So it's not even the only uh, emergency response. Um, the, uh, there are some ways that WHO can support countries to accelerate, but I've actually already talked about one of them, which is identifying the bottlenecks and targeting our resources to overcoming them. Some others include scaling innovations, working better together in the multilateral system, more collaboratively, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, at the end of the day, leadership, which is what I mentioned in the foundation of the uh, house. So accelerating back, and to your point, which specific, uh, almost any service that's been looked at has been disrupted. And that will have consequences on mortality rates of women and children's health, in HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, in non-communicable disease. I'm sure at the University of Chicago, you know people who didn't have coronary bypass surgery, who otherwise would have had because of the pandemic. And so this affects every country in the world. And, and as we get into those better days, the recovery, primary health care, getting back on track and accelerating in some of the ways I described is going to be absolutely uh, uh, vital. Um, and if there's one thing we've learned in the pandemic is how health is the foundation of, um, of, uh, of economies, of prosperity and of national security. And uh, as Dr. Tedros says, without health, there is nothing. Um, and there's only one way to solve the economic crisis that COVID-19 has wrought. And that way is to solve the public health crisis. No other way. It just really shows the centrality of health to almost everything we do and cherish in our society. Great. Turning to the topic of vaccines, there are a number of questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, the first is the Russian vaccine has largely been dismissed in public discourse. Does it deserve more credit than we have given it? I think um, 
uh, let me put it this way, WHO is in the midst of evaluating data uh, from uh, vaccine manufacturers. And um, I think that uh, every vaccine deserves uh, fair scrutiny based on the data, based on the data provided. And WHO will certainly be looking carefully at data from uh, vaccines in the wherever they arise. And what I can assure you of is WHO will not endorse a vaccine unless we believe that it's safe and uh, effective. Um, I can also say that don't think about this as being about a vaccine. Think about this as being about vaccines for all kinds of reasons. Different vaccines may have different efficacy in different populations. Different vaccines have different distribution challenges. Um, different vaccines will ultimately have different prices. And this is about distributing vaccines to 8 billion people around the world because none of us is safe until all of us is safe. All of us are safe. Mm -hmm. I actually looked this up. You can use is or are. Uh, but uh, um, uh, so uh, that's again, showing some of the value of WHO in terms of um, evaluating the data of any vaccine, regardless of its origin, uh, carefully, and, uh, and also providing guidance as to um, courses for courses, if you will, which vaccine or vaccines might be most relevant in which settings and which contexts. And again, let me remind you that there's no silver bullet. It's not an on-off switch. It's not going to happen overnight. And until, during, and after a vaccine rollout, it's very, very important to continue the public health measures that we talked about. The next question is, could you speak to the ethical principles you rely on when developing the COVAX initiative? How do you determine how, when, and where to distribute the vaccine to low and middle income countries? So um, the, uh, the, I think probably the most important ethical principle is the principle of solidarity, that you do want to do it in the first place. Um, and interestingly enough, I went back and looked something like 20 years ago in some journal called the uh, like International Affairs, Sali Benatar, Abdullah Dar and I, uh, all mentored by Mark, wrote an article about values in global health ethics. And I dug into it, I kind of imply that, you know, it's a catalog of different values, equity. And, and, and we certainly list solidarity there and almost imply that um, it's primum inter pares. And then some of that work uh, we picked up later in um, developing a uh, ethical framework for pandemic preparedness in the context of SARS-1, uh, which hit Canada very hard. So um, solidarity is actually a very, very important ethical principle. Um, and that's one that Dr. Tedros talks about all the time. Another very important ethical principle is equity. Uh, because um, uh, again, if there's anything COVID has revealed, it's the pre-existing social inequities in our society. And it's shown a very harsh light on that. And equity is a very, very important principle. So from principles like solidarity, equity, um, and others, you end up, you, you get to a practical allocation framework that focuses on um, uh, health workers uh, on, and on the vulnerable, people who are elderly and people who um, have comorbidities. Because as you know, the mortality rate of COVID uh, varies drastically depending on your uh, comorbidity. And it's not always the ones you'd expect, you know? Uh, maybe it's, I don't, maybe I won't get into specifics, but it's, uh, you know, hypertension, et cetera, some, some really interesting comorbidities as we understand more and more about the physiology uh, and the pathophysiology of COVID-19. And I'm not an expert in that, so I won't delve into it anymore so I don't get myself in, uh, in, in a place that I don't know about. Great. Following up on, on sort of the principle of solidarity, the next question is, you said it would save more lives to have some people in every country vaccinated. This makes sense from the WHO perspective. However, it seems that individual countries would have an interest in ensuring their own citizens get vaccines as soon as possible, even at the expense of other countries. So I think we're talking about vaccine nationalism here. So how has this played out in reality? 
And is there any mechanism by which any organization, government or agency is attempting to influence this in any way? So uh, I think that's a very good question, Brian, a very good point. Um, you know, let me just start by acknowledging that obviously the first uh, order of uh, business for political leaders is to protect their citizens. No question about that. That takes you back to um, political philosophy and, and, but at the same time, uh, you know, um, uh, WHO has talked about vaccines as a global good. Dr. Tedros has spoken out against um, what he would say is misguided nationalism. Uh, and the practical example is, um, you know, when we see um, people who are at very low risk being uh, vaccinated in country X and health workers who are putting themselves in harm's way in country Y uh, in a COVID ward that maybe is overflowing with patients not being vaccinated, I think we're going to have to give... Uh, give that a very, very hard think about what exactly is going on in the world and what kind of world we want to, uh, what kind of world we want to have. And we are going to see um, challenges in equity, shall we say, arise in the next six months. And that's why I wanted to start with young people, because at a minimum, uh, we want to call out those inequities. First of all, we want to measure them. We want to see them. We want them to be transparent. Secondly, and data is very important here, Secondly, uh, I think we want to call them out. And, and by we, I actually mean you. Obviously, the World Health Organization has done and will do its part to advocate for solidarity, for equity in every possible way. And that's what we did with that resolution I mentioned on, um, on immunization as a global global good. At the same time, uh, I think it's up to citizens and including young people to speak out, to raise your voice for equity. Raise your voice for equity. And when you see inequity developing, and sadly, I think that we may in the coming months uh, related to vaccine rollout, um, speak out about it. And then you asked about motivations. Sure, there is an issue in charity here. Um, you know, and uh, Americans are charitable people in terms of international assistance and so on. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's also an issue in self-interest because, um, uh, COVID will travel right around the world. You won't be able to restart international trade and travel. You won't be able to be safe, actually, um, because of international travel, because the virus tra viruses don't carry passports. Uh, none of us is safe until all of us are safe. So this is an issue in charity, but it's also an issue in rational self-interest. And so, uh, Brian, I hope that answers your question. It's not a straightforward or easy question, but there's one practical thing that everybody on this video conference can do. It's in the next six months, in the next year. Um, tune into those inequities and raise your voice for equity uh, when, when, when the need arises because um, some of the best leaders, including at heads of state, from, from heads of state right down to communities, are dedicated to uh, issues in equity, stand with marginalized communities. Um, and uh, and uh, it's very important for everyone, uh, especially including, I think, young people to raise their voice for equity, to bend uh, maybe the actions of those who don't towards equity. And many, many times over the past year, um, I've uh, thought about uh, that fantastic uh, statement from Martin Luther King about the uh, uh, arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And we can accelerate that uh, arc, I think, by raising our voice for equity. And that's it. If there's one task that we should be doing in the coming six months, all of us, that's it. Now, now the, sort of the solidarity principle seems a pretty challenging uh, you know, principle to sort of implement in the sense of there's a lot of heterogeneity, I think, in terms of social, cultural, and sort of ethical approaches. The next question sort of gets to that in asking, do you feel like nations like the US that put so much value on respect for autonomy of patients are more likely to have a harder time emphasize, emphasizing principles like solidarity? Uh, and, and I think this sort of taps into as well, the rise of medical populism. Uh, 
Can you address that? Well, I'm Canadian, so it's not for me to say what the <laughs> folks in the U.S. should do. Actually, I'm an international public servant, so I, I also have an oath of neutrality related to uh, uh, countries. Um, but uh, having said that, you know, when I was at the University of Chicago, yeah, we read uh, Mill, we read uh, other versions of this uh, in, the, in the law school there. Um, uh, but, uh, but we also read Tocqueville. And I think uh, rediscovering some of, uh, uh, some of those uh, communitarian uh, philosophical currents that I had the pleasure of learning with Stephen Toulman uh, and others, I think uh, uh, can, can, be very, very, uh, can be very useful. I think it becomes quite pragmatic though when you see the image that I described of the um, overworked, tired nurse in uh, a rural African setting who has a very significant chance of death uh, in comparison. And I think we have to ask ourselves what we owe that nurse. And I think we owe that nurse a lot. Um, and, uh, and I think we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to act accordingly. You know, the other day, Dr. Tedros was asked at the press conference whether he would uh, take the vaccine publicly like, um, uh, like uh, some of your former presidents said that they would. And he had a brilliant and beautiful response. He said, yes, I will take it publicly when it's my turn because I'm not displacing someone uh, who otherwise might be ahead of me in line. I thought that was a fantastic response that really, um, really uh, emphasized this practical principle of equity. And by the way, while we're on the topic of solidarity and equity, one concrete instantiation of that is actually fully funding the COVAX uh, facility of Gavi, CEPI, and WHO um, uh, of the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. That's what's going to help. And yes, 4.3 billion through the end of this year, 23.9 billion for 2021. That might seem like a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money when you compare it with the economic damage and human suffering that's been wrought by COVID-19. It's probably, it's one of the best value for money propositions there is. So let's do that. And uh, I think that's a message for every country in the world. And those countries that really have stepped up to fund that facility uh, really deserve, I think, the respect and appreciation of all of us and of all countries and of all citizens in the world. So, so all that said, what do you see as the greatest threats to equitable vaccine distribution, and what suggestions do you have to prevent or respond to those? Well, I mean, on the on the plus side, the, the greatest threats are the types of questions you're asking. Uh, I think the greatest opportunity is for us to reflect on our values and the value of solidarity, which has to underpin uh, the value of uh, equity. And concretely, there's a very very concrete thing that can be done which is uh, funding the COVAX pillar of the ACT uh, Accelerate. I don't wanna seem redundant about this, but that's really a, a life or death issue for many people. And it is an issue of national security for every country in the world. The national security, the economic prosperity of any country in the world, including the United States, is not only gained by actions within a particular country, it's also gained by actions around the world. And in this case, very beneficial actions of um, ensuring vaccines and in particular vaccination and getting vaccination vaccines in the arms of uh, people around the world. And I think this is a great time for reflection. It's an important time for leadership. And of course, I mentioned the importance of communities. It's a very important time for diverse voices not only to be heard, but to be at the decision table making decisions at all from the highest levels of government to community leadership. Uh, I know we're running close on time. I'll try to squeeze in another, another question. In relation to your comment on trust in, and on tracking, the CDC is asking states to report the identities of individuals who have been vaccinated. This is giving rise to considerable privacy concerns. Do you think this degree of identification is indeed necessary? That um, the WHO has to leave individual decisions to individual jurisdictions. And uh, 
I, I, I don't think it's uh, for me to comment specifically on that, but I will say one thing. The United States is blessed with some of the most fantastic uh, health institutions in the world. The CDC, which you mentioned, Brian, the FDA, the NIH, um, these are some of the uh, most uh, respected, if you take the historical view over decades, most respected institutions in the world. And uh, these institutions have worked very closely with the World Health Organization since its inception um, and uh, have continued to, to do so through the pandemic and, and long may that continue. And that's a great benefit, um, USAID, uh, it's a great benefit to, uh, to the people of the world. And uh, I think that's something that uh, Americans should value and cherish. The last question, sort of coming back to sol solidarity, uh, one of the attendees notes that solidarity is, an interest, is interesting to consider as an ethical principle. Um, can't reasonable people or even countries disagree? Well, I think there's, a, you know, um, I talked about the first uh, first uh, responsibility, if you will, of leaders. But let's boil solidarity down in very practical terms. Uh, wear a mask, fund COVAX, and uh, make sure that the vaccine is just, and raise your voice, and raise your voice for equity. Tweet. When you see an inequity, tweet. And while you're at it, tag me, at Peter A. Singer. So um, wear a mask. Uh, wear a mask, and of course, all the other public health measures. Um, wear a mask, fund COVAX, and tweet when you see inequity. Uh, that's the very practical version of, uh, of the solidarity uh, and equity principles. Well, with that, I'll bite my tongue with regards to social media and disinformation campaigns. Um, but with that, I'll give you sort of Mark the last word to wrap up this session. And again, thank you very much, Dr. Singer. This was, this was wonderful. And I think we very much appreciate all the work that, that you are doing on behalf of the global community. Thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and let me just say that disinformation on social media is a problem. And WHO has partnered with the largest social media companies uh, to make sure that when you go search Google, or when you're on Facebook or Twitter, you're more likely to be directed to reputable sources of information locally and the World Health Organization because of those partnerships. And um, haven't partnered with, but even aligned with um, the gaming uh, companies, because it turns out, I didn't know this, they reach a log frame of people more, tens of billions of people, as opposed to billions of people, impressions, um, obviously not uh, individual people, because uh, there's only 8 billion in the world. Uh, and so if you're gaming, you will see um, some WHO health messages going down your gaming channels. And so that just gives you a sense of how in tune WHO is um, with, uh, with uh, doing everything it can do to save lives. And that's maybe the place where I now end, which is, uh, uh, that's really what WHO is about. It's about saving lives, especially the most vulnerable, marginalized, but everybody, and it's relevant to every country, and I'm proud. Uh, to be associated with it and very happy to be with you today, Brian. And it's great, uh, Mark, to be with you. And again, let me end with my respect and appreciation for the incredible work that you've done over the, the whole length of your career. It's, I think, uh, remarkable. And uh, people in Chicago, people around the United States and people around the world should appreciate and do appreciate your contribution. And thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much. It, it, the talk was extraordinary, and and the um, uh, the development and changes in the WHO since 2017, when Dr. Tedros and you uh, jo joined the program, um, have had a tremendous international impact, and will continue to do so. Um, uh, and and your background. In, in Canada and, and in part of your training in the States um, is, is moving to all of us. Um, I, I just wanna thank you so much for, for joining us today and um, for the work that you're doing, um, especially for developing countries uh, as part of the COVAX program 
Um, and, um, and for those who are most vulnerable, um, not just in, in the COVAX countries, developing countries, but also in Canada and the United States and, and, and European countries. Um, it's a great honor to have you here and look forward to uh, seeing you soon um, in the future. Thank you so much for all of your great work. Thank, Thank you, Mark. It's a privilege to be with you and with everyone here. Thank you so much. And uh, see you on Twitter. Bye, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.